Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Um, it looks like we've got about 48 people who have signed on now. Uh, my name is Haley, and I'm here to welcome you from the Columbia Mountains Institute of Applied Ecology, or CMI for short. Um, and I join you today for the sixth season of CRED Talks. Those are the Columbia Region Ecological Discussions. Um, welcome. As I said, we're really happy to have you here today. Uh, I hope you've been taking in the whole of the series and, and I hope you've been sharing the recordings with your network. Um, in this season of CRUD Talks, we are, of course, many of you already know, but we are exploring the theme of climate disruption in the Upper Columbia Basin. We're welcoming eight scientists to address projected impacts, potential for adaptation, and what we can do with ecosystems that may in fact contribute to mitigation. If you're in attendance today, for one thing, you've heard this intro many times already, and I apologize and, and I thank you for your patience as I go through it again. Um, and you've likely already seen the impressive list of speakers that have already spoken and, and some that are still to come. If you're reviewing the recording, however, I encourage you to go to the webpage for the event and look at the full suite of talks um, because collectively they're going, to, they're going to tell a bigger story. Um, you can find that web page, of course, on our website, which is www.cmiae.org. You should be able to see that address on the top right-hand side of your screen. Today, we're going to hear from Dr. Martin Carver, and I'll introduce him in more detail in just a moment. The CRED Talks are financially supported by the Columbia Basin Trust. We share our gratitude with them for providing the funds needed to get this series off the ground. This series is also generously supported by all of you. Without your donations, this project would not be possible. And truly, thank you very much for your support. Um, if you're reviewing the recordings at a later date and you would like to contribute to the series as we have received some contributions that way already, again, thank you to you as well. So before I go any further, I'd like to just pause for a moment and acknowledge and honor the four nations on whose unceded territory I broadcast from today in Revelstoke, BC. So for me, that is the Tanayak, the Tanaha, the Sequapum, and the Silk. And what I'd like to do now as a means of testing out our chat to make sure that it's working and as a means of welcoming you and inviting you to introduce yourself is to put into the chat, as Susan has already done, thanks Susan, she, she knows the drill, um, you're welcome to introduce yourself and, and share the First Nations um, acknowledgement, the land acknowledgement on your end and the spirit of reconciliation. So I welcome you to do that right now. The chat, of course, if you're not familiar, can be found on the lower um, control panel at the bottom of your screen. So if you hover your mouse at the bottom, you'll see a little chat icon. You can click on that and then a chat box will open up and you'll be able to type to everyone in that spot. Thanks, Jenny. All right, so as those come in, um, I'm just gonna take this moment to tell you a little bit about the host organization, the Columbia Mountains Institute of Applied Ecology, um, of which I'm the executive director. CMI is, the non, is a nonprofit society and an association of people working in the various fields of ecology. And our home range is Southern British Columbia, Canada, of course, but increasingly we're seeing membership from across BC into Alberta, the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. One of the main things that we do is provide professional development opportunities. And those come in the form of webinars, of course, conferences, courses, workshops, and that sort of thing. Um, for the sake of making this intro a little bit shorter, I won't run into run through a bunch of examples for you, but I'll encourage you to go to our website for more information. You can click on the past events um, button at the top of our webpage, and, and you'll see a big long list of the types of events that we host. And of course, on the homepage are our upcoming events, of which I'm going to be making some new announcements soon. So it would be worth checking back there next week. Um, the other thing you can find on our website are great resources such as proceeding documents. So larger events such as conferences produce a proceeding document and, and they have all sorts of really um, interesting and often very useful information that you can find. Our typical audience is well captured by the mix of people who have registered for this series, in fact whereby I see representatives from environmental consultants, academics, students, industry representatives, nonprofits, First Nation governments, and provincial and municipal resource managers. All right, so now what we're gonna do is um, get into the nitty gritty details of, of the Zoom platform that we're using today and, and how you might interact with us in this way. 
So first, I just want to note, and you probably heard upon signing in, that the webinar is being recorded. These recordings, as I noted, will be posted on our event webpage um, within about one week of the event taking place. However, we've been getting them up earlier, so they're usually there by about Tuesday if you're looking for the, for the recording. And as I said earlier, those recordings um, from prior talks are already posted there, so, so feel free to listen in on those if you happen to miss them. We're in the webinar format as opposed to the meeting format, and this means that our attendees, um, their cameras have been disabled, and you've also all been muted. Um, if you would like to be unmuted, however, you do have the option of raising your hand. So if you take your mouse again to the control panel at the bottom of your screen, there's the raise hand icon. I'll just raise mine now. Um, and that will signal to us that you would like to speak if, for example, you want to ask a question at the end of the presentation. Feel free to raise your hand and um, we'll know to unmute you. The chat feature is enabled, as you saw, and this is a place where you are welcomed to share resources with one another. But we're not going to be posting questions in the chat. For the questions, we're going to be using the Q&A feature. So again, icons should be at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, it'll open up a Q&A box. Um, and as I am talking, I would like uh, my volunteer in the audience, Mark andre if you're listening, to put a sample. Oh, he's on it to put a sample question in there. So you'll see that Marc-Andre just asked the question, is the sharp-tailed grouse really pointy? <laughs> That's great. Um, and what I want to point out here is that we've enabled the upvote feature, which has been working out really well. So if somebody like Marc-Andre asks a question that you'd like to hear the answer to as well, you can click on that thumbs up. So perhaps somebody try that right now. And um, what will happen from me is I will order these uh, questions in the order of most, most upvotes, and I will present them to Martin at the end um, by in an order of popularity. Okay, so you are, thanks, we've got three upvotes on that. Perfect, you should be able to see how that's working. Um, you're welcomed to put questions into the Q&A as they come to you. We will hold them, the questions over until the end, just so you know. Um, what else do I want to say? If you would like to get in touch with um, my Myself or Nicole Trick, who is in the background with me, helping with um, technical details because you're experiencing some issues that you might help need help with. Just send us a chat, and you can do that by clicking the drop-down menu and sending it to hosts and panelists, and that will get our attention, and, and we'll be able to help you with whatever issues, or we'll try anyways to help you with whatever issues you might be experiencing. Um, okay, I think that's it. So now, without further ado, let's move on to the real reason why you're all here today. I'd like to welcome Dr. Martin Carver, who will present Transition Hydrology en route to a new runoff regime. Martin, Car Martin Carver is a hydrologist and fluvial geomorphologist with over 25 years experience in water resources and land and land use analysis. His work is focused on the Columbia, Athabasca, Peace River, and Liard basins and emphasizes climate change preparedness. His interests range from project impact assessment to hydrologic risk analysis and conservation planning and the design of monitoring networks. He has worked in Canada, Nepal, and Ecuador, and he now works across Western Canada as an independent consultant and researcher based in Nelson, BC. So we're really fortunate to have Martin with us today. Welcome, Martin. Thank you very much. And so Martin, you can share over my screen now. Am I sharing properly? You are, you're up. You're up. Great. great, well, thank you for the introduction and um, thanks to CMI for the invitation to uh, participate in this series. Um, and thank you to all the participants for attending. Also appreciate CBT for providing funding for this series. Um, I'd also like to say that I also enjoy my life on the, the ancestral lands of a number of First Nations, the Sinaiks, the Tunaka, the Sequepunk, and the Silk Silkanagan. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge a few people who have contributed to today's uh, presentation, Hans Schreier, who I've worked with on some analysis, Greg Hutzig, Mel Reisner, 
and Sam Lister. So I'm just going to carry on the baton that uh, Janice Brainy did last week. Uh, in her talk, um, we were all connected to the one prior to us. Well, I also worked on the same project with Janice. We didn't actively work together, but it was a project about five years ago before she became a prof at Utah State. So it's continuing. And although it's hard to claim that this talk is an upbeat talk, I would like to at least share in the fascination for the science of what's happening on our, in our water resources. It's um, truly a, an amazing puzzle to um, decode. Okay. The past and the future. We're heading into a, a new future. And although this image makes it look rather elegant, I can't say it is going to be particularly elegant. Um, the transition is going to be messy, bumpy, and that's it's the transition that this talk is about, not the future. That is too far away for us to um, have much of an idea for what it's going to be like. And it's going to be characterized by unpredictability. And I think that's going to be a theme in the talk today. And unfortunately, the future isn't a particularly attractive one. It's certainly got fire uh, and smoke and a whole bunch of other things in store, landslides, geomorphic activity. But again, the talk isn't about all of that. It's about the hydrologic changes that are occurring now as in the early part of the transition. Okay, a brief outline then. Um, I've got five areas I want to talk a bit about variability and um, how much there is in the system. Uh, the cryosphere decline, uh, Brian Menounis shared about glaciers and I'll briefly touch in on snow. Uh, the surface runoff is um, the focus of the talk, I, but I do want to introduce some secondary changes and feedbacks and then uh, uh, possible responses that we may want to entertain uh, given what is underway. Now, Climate extremes, I think intuitively, we can relate to heavy precipitation. When it comes and there is direct, a direct outcome as, the, as there was with the atmospheric river that went all the way to Calgary, caused tremendous damage there, but also caused quite a bit of geomorphic activity here in the Kootenays. You can see a number of creeks where it was blown out or there were high flows over a short period because of high precipitation. Now, clearly we all intuitively understand that and we, we, we get the cause and effect that's involved. But actually most hydrologic changes are not so obvious. If I could just go back to uh, Mel Reisner's long-term change in mean annual temperature across the upper Columbia Basin based on the um, Environment Canada climate stations you can see on the map. This is an average of an average. So these are um, uh, highly synthesized uh, plots. And you can see that there is a tremendous amount of variability evident in the climate system. Well, there's also a tremendous amount of variability in the surface response. And um, I'm gonna be focused mostly on this period of this uh, record, the last 20 years or so. Well, we can ask the question, what does it look like, those climate uh, changes on, on a monthly basis at these climate stations? And we can see that it shouldn't surprise us that uh, for monthly average temperatures, we're starting to see a signature of them in different months, depending on the year. Here we are with the climate stations down the left and the, the uh, months along the uh, top. We're also seeing signatures of the high precipitation uh, record high monthly precipitation is in this plot, and we're seeing it arrive at different years, uh, perhaps not as often as the temperature records are being broken. Okay, so it's showing up at that scale. How about the landscape? What kind of sources of vari variability do we have to contend with there? Well, there are water bodies that are uh, quite variable and uh, I won't be able to, to even talk about the lakes and wetlands and groundwater this talk just because it's too much, but there's, th there isn't just one um, water body out there that's responding and they all have different uh, behaviors. But then also land use activities, they have a great effect. Our human activities on the land have a great effect in modifying the surface response to, to these uh, climate and hydrologic changes. 
So there's a lot of variability to uh, see through to, in order to see what's happening. And so not surprisingly, then that takes a while usually before we can definitively say something's happening. But we can see some things already. Oh yeah, one other source of variability then is in interpretations. Uh, there's uh, great variations in scale. You know, we have these uh, major valley bottom systems in the upper Columbia Basin that uh, really characterize the area, and many of them are filled with reservoirs. But we also have uh, many scales of tributaries from the large valley bottom systems, um, the, the, the larger systems um, like the Elk and the Slocan and that, and then smaller ones uh, right down to residual areas where we'll have uh, streams of just a few square kilometers. So how these respond is uh, varies with spatial scale as well. And I'll be coming back to that a little bit in the talk. So a recap on the cryosphere decline. Cryosphere is the fro where water is frozen. Um, just very briefly then, the projection from the work of uh, Brian Manunas and his colleagues is that sometime within the next 70 to 100 years, there'll be a virtual complete loss of glaciers in the basin. Um, they are, of course, very important for areas where they, uh, downstream of areas where they occur. At, but many watersheds, it's important to remember, you can see where they occur on the left here. Many watersheds are not affected by glaciers directly, um, particularly these smaller consumptive use streams. And of course, water, water, water bodies in the southern portion of the basin. Snow, however, does affect the entire Columbia Basin. So a snow is um, more of a pervasive impact. Okay, so talking about snow then, um, and this is a, a time series of the precipitation at Caslow fall, falling as snow and rain in March. And it's just as an illustration to point out that there has been a rise in rain and a decline in snow. I think we all know that intuitively. Um, so what does this look like though over the whole, um, the whole basin rather than just uh, one spot? Well, I've got a couple of slides here showing the change in um, proportion of winter precipitation uh, falling as snow at different areas in the watershed. So on the right, you see hydrologic regions, and I'm gonna draw your attention to two. The one where I'm living, Lower Columbia Kootenai, and the other one north of Revelstoke, or centered around Revelstoke. You can see that the, that the proportion of winter precipitation is going to decline from, um, you know, it depends on the region, but from 80 to 90%, and then we'll drop to 50 to 80% over the coming um, decades. This is to the end of the century, and uh, based on a kind of an average between um, business as usual and a very optimistic emission scenario. I won't spend much time talking about the emission scenarios because it doesn't really play a big role in the talk today. Um, so there's also, you can also look at um, major valley bottoms. And of course they start out with less snow and they decline um, to, to small amounts to eventually to a pluvial system or near pluvial. So that's, um, that's quite a change because snow remember is a very sensitive indicator to climate change and to temperature changes, much more sensitive than uh, many other factors. And this winter, uh, um, behavior is also mirrored in the seasonal behavior. And here you can see the winter is the blue and then the other three seasons are in the other three colors. And we get a, um, quite low levels of, um, of a snowfall uh, through the century, um, both at the high elevation source areas and the valley bottoms. So quite some changes in snow in store for us. What will those changes mean for surface hydrology? There's been a number of changes we've talked about so far then. Well, let's first of all, look at what we could call the generic snowmelt hydrograph. And um, just, just to discuss in general terms, almost theoretical terms, what should happen. So there, there is a typical hydrograph of the upper Columbia Basin and it's been forced by a number of models um, into the future, and this is for Duncan River at Duncan Dam. And you can see that um, all the models are a little different, but they generally have some characteristics which unite them. Um, 
And here they are. So higher winter flows, earlier snow melts, higher peak flows. You can see the dark black, right? The, the, the black line is the, um, the baseline. Earlier peak flows and then lower summer falls. So that would be, I'd say, a sort of genericization over the long term that this would eventually come to pass. Um, if you force it with the climate that we ex the, the climate that we uh, expect to see, and you can do this for other basins, and you get a similar result. This is coming from work from about a decade ago from um, the Peakic in Victoria, still totally relevant today. So I'll be coming back to the salmon later, by the way. Okay, so that's a, a sort of generic expectation. Let's look at a particular couple of um, drainages, potential interest. Here we have two small drainages, Redfish Creek and Duhamel Creek. They're, um, the sizes are written down here and they're small drainages draining into the west arm of Kootenai Lake. Very important for fish, water supply, recreation and uh, biodiversity values. A, on the left, you have precipitation temperature plots, which kind of put in um, context all of the, the climate from the, the climate record. The upper plot is Caslow, the lower one is Nelson, and on the right, the upper one is Redfish, the lower one is Duhamel. And you can see that 2016 was a very hot um, April. These are all April, and it resulted in a rapid snow melt and a record runoff. It blew away the previous record. And then, um, I'll get rid of my picture here. Uh, yeah. And then if we move on to June, so that was, that was 2016. Now we're looking at 2012. All of a, all of a sudden, <laughs> it's different. It's, quite cool, but very high precipitation, record breaking, and it led to record runoff in June. And you can also look at 2015 with very hot and dry conditions leading to record low runoff. So within the space of just a few years, we've both had record high and record low, and we've had different mechanisms causing it. Okay, so that's kind of like an anecdote. Let's sit back a little bit and look at more streams and more months. So here's 17 streams with water survey data across the upper Columbia basin and all 12 months. And you can see that it's popping up all over the place. We are seeing records broken on high monthly discharge um, almost in every month in the last, well, even the last 10 years, but certainly the last 20 years. And then we can look at low monthly discharge. These aren't being as broken as quickly, but they're being broken. Okay, I mentioned scale earlier, and I'd like to walk through a number of plots here showing uh, the effect of scale on these changes, because I think we can't ignore scale. Perhaps what we just saw was um, in the anecdote was scale related. Okay, so I'm gonna walk through five uh, drainages and look at how their history of um, mean monthly flows has changed. So let's start with Anderson Creek, which is a small drainage just above Nelson. Uh, Nelson gets some of its drinking water from Anderson Creek. It's a low elevation drainage, quite small. And here then, first of all, I'll just say that you can see that the, this is February, April, May, and June. And you can see that this early, late winter, or early spring runoff is generally increasing, which again is consistent with that generic expectation that I showed earlier. Um, and it, in this case, June, remember this is a low elevation watershed, it's declining. And in, in, in just this one drainage, we've got four extreme years, really extreme, in four different years. So this small drainage seems to be quite vulnerable to um, climate change. Here we are in the same drainage, and you can see there's it's not so obvious that it's declining, but August has seemed to decline. And uh, now we're seeing some extreme low flows, not just the peak flows. 
And let's see. Moving on to Arrow Creek then, this is um, uh, 78 square kilometer drainage near Creston, very important for water supply uh, for the Creston area. And here again, the spring is generally increasing and um, not sure about the fall. Um, there are peaks showing up in many different years for the mean monthly flows at this scale as well. Caslow. Now we're in the hundreds in Cas of square kilometers. Caslow sits between the Caslow River sits between New Denver and um, Caslow, and is an important fish stream. Um, it's um, also important recreationally, and it has high elevation snowpacks and a glacier or two, I believe. Anyway, here we see the signature of rising. Um, late winter, early spring um, flows, and here more um, clearly a reduction in July and August. Again, we have some peaks being broken, um, not so clear about the low flow this 2015 year, um, but remember this is a larger drainage. Salmo is very similar to Caslo, broken records in a number of years, especially the peaks, but we are seeing 2021 brought a low flow in, in the Salmo broken record. And last example then is the Slocan. This is the biggest of the set. A generally rising spring, um, late winter spring flows. At this scale, records have been broken in 2012, 2015, 2016, and a, a low flow record or two. So we do see a signature of changing climate across scales. And there is a hint at different mechanisms, though this is just a descriptive um, walkthrough that we're doing. Um, I want to just bring your attention to these two here, this 2012 uh, peak flow record, and then three years later, a, a low flow record. I'm calling it a tale of two freshets, each with record monthly flows. So we start with 2015. So the plots on the right show February, March, and May. Um, on, the, on the left column is the um, Slocan mean monthly discharge for February, March, and May. And then the right is the precip temperature plots. And you can see that the 2015 temperature was very high. It led to a record discharge um, in February and in March. And then by the time May came around, 2015 flows were quite low. You know, they were already getting in the middle of the pack after being at record levels. And then moving over to the 2012, now we have low temperatures and high precipitation, this um, yellow dot here, leading to a record discharge. And it didn't break a record, but it was pretty high. Here it broke a record in um, July. And then in August, already dropping. So we have the same phenomenon, a peak discharge brought on by totally different mechanisms just within a couple of years of each other. Kind of chaotic to study. And this, this slide is just to show that the projections are into the future um, with uh, the climate models and using hydrologic models that the seasonal runoff will continue with this pattern, that winter precipitation will rise. Spring will also rise. Summer precip will drop. Sorry, this isn't precip, this is seasonal runoff. Um, and then the fall will modestly increase or stay the same depending on where you are. So those patterns we expect to continue through the century, which is the period of these models typically. So it looks like we have a long road ahead still and those changes that are already happening are going to deepen considerably. Now, streamflow timing, huge important topic because the annual runoff is highly seasonal. And as we see, a lot of these changes are actually pushing the timing earlier. And we're all tightly adapted, ecological systems, human systems, here you see fish and power, and there's lots of other needs 
um, around environmental flows and the timing is quite critical. There's also already been an advance of about one to four weeks in freshet timing that has occurred across Western North America. This is with a focus on interior regions. A number of studies look at that and further advances projected under future climates. Somewhere I read up to two months, but um, certainly in the four weeks plus range is expected. Some work's been done in the Fraser Basin specifically looking at that. And very interesting papers these are because they they show that the warming, sorry, the advanced timing is being driven by winter and spring warming. There's a lot of other effects, but this is the main driver and that the warming that is causing changes in precipitation, that that is just hastening the stream flow timing. But the main driver is that winter and spring warming. This seasonal redistribution of runoff is very problematic for summer drought for a variety of reasons, water supply, uh, environmental flows in general. And it's basically moving uh, runoff from the summer and late spring to the early spring and late winter. Variabilities, that topic I brought up earlier, it, it makes it difficult to uh, detect these signals, but lots of work has been done on this. Climate oscillations, um, have been found to not be the cause, that the timing advances are in fact due to human-induced climate changes, not that internal variability in the climate system. Um, and interestingly, increases in precipitation are not generally compensated for the losses due to the continued warming. So the, the warming is having an effect. We are getting a bit of compensatory precipitation, but it doesn't keep up with the effects of the warming. And as I've said before, oh, the glacial melt uh, lifts, oh, didn't talk about this, lifts late summer runoff temporarily, um, which contrasts with other non-glacierized basins, but that's a short-term effect which will um, be gone at some point. Now, so what, right? Well, there's a lot of so what's on this one. Um, the, it, the most obvious is um, shown here where you get you know, dramatic impacts from a landslide. Uh, this is a very uh, potent example from Johnson's Landing at the north end of Kootenai Lake. You see the um, precipitation uh, time series there. And in uh, June uh, 2012, there was uh, precipitation for the month of June that was something like four times the average, as you can see in the plot. And then there was uh, sustained heating, uh, there, there was decreased soil strength, and then the landslide occurred. And of course, tremendous consequences. People were killed, houses destroyed. Um, you can see the list of other issues. And this is an emerging threat from this issue. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But, but there's also uh, uh, feedbacks and a host of others of secondary impacts that I just want to touch in on. And really, this is a whole talk on all on its own. And of course, there is, there is uh, uh, Mike Flanagan, who's going to be speaking about fire later in this series. But I just want to mention that high severity fires can create hydrophobic soils, which may resist infiltration and encourage rapid runoff. This is a picture of the Deer Creek fire um, from 2018. And so this wildfire in, is increasing the risk of high peak flows when uh, the loss of forest cover occurs in mid to high elevations in particular. We get um, less likelihood of uh, infiltration from the change in the soils, one problem. And second problem, loss of forest cover, which means there's more water running on, uh, it can be at a higher melt rates. And if we also are building roads and trails to fire, fight, or protect, or to salvage log, that even encourages further runoff. So there's a kind of amplification of the initial effect um, through these feedbacks and, and uh, follow-up activities. And I've got a, a, a bit of space there on the right of the slide about the importance of forests in moderating flow and sediment regimes. Like they really are a gift to our landscape that the mountains are draped with these forests, which tend to moderate all sorts of processes. And so any impact which then takes away that forest is, is going to um, lead to 
additional impacts which generally don't go in the right direction. And there's a couple of examples here too, a forest health implications of climate change can cause further forest loss and therefore further detrimental changes in surface runoff. And soot and debris from wildfire fires can cause accelerated melt of glaciers. And there, there's kind of a, a list of issues there. Too much for today, but uh, it um, adds to the initial concern. So I want to run through three examples of geomorphic consequences of wildfire. Here's an example from 2003. There was a fire in the um, north of Creston area in the Kuskunut Great drainage. And in 2003, hydrophobic soils resulted. There was a summer rainstorm just the next year. And then there was um, a landslide, houses destroyed, highway blocked, and ongoing risks. And what we're seeing there then is an interaction between the um, fire and um, rain, uh, rain events. The rain event doesn't need to be anything extreme once the soils have been um, um, kind of reduced in their capability for in infiltration. There can be this combination, but of course the rain may also be getting more extreme because of climate change, which is a part of this story that I haven't been able to talk about today, and that is the intensification of precipitation. But that's um, for another day. So the second example is a recent one, the Octopus Creek wildfire from 2021. Uh, large areas of high burn severity occurred in debris flood prone watersheds. This is east of the Arrow Creek Res Arrow Reservoir. And then the outcome, of course, is this elevated risk of debris floods, flooding, and water quality impacts. And that fire just happened, and we've got the Fourchette coming up next year, and, and the uh, downstream areas are, of course, on alert for that. And the third example dates back to 2007, when wildfire burned in the Springer Creek area east of Slocan Lake. And you can see the map here, including the burn severity uh, mapping. And debris flows occurred in the following three years due to um, the high burn severity. You can see the debris flow lines and the source area and where they went. Um, so this is from what's happened so far as um, the impacts of climate change uh, and fires increase, we will see more and more of these secondary uh, impacts, which is concerning for sure. Now, this is a blue sky slide. <laughs> I just wanted to take a pause before I move to sort of the final step stage of the talk and, and ask, our, ask openly what's in store in the coming decades. It's difficult to say because there's so many things shifting. Uh, there's so many moving parts. And in no particular order, I'd just like to mention, first of all, there's the reduction of the glaciers. And that in that period, it's, it's happened already in some parts of the basin, I, I believe. But in that period, peak glacial melt will have passed. So we'll be on the declining um, curve of the uh, glacial melt. There's eventually going to be a pullback of snow, but the pacing is very much uncertain at higher elevations. There could even be an increase in snow for some time at the, where it's cold enough. Because remember, precipitation is increasing. So that looks like it's going to be uneven. Uh, there's an uneven advanced timing of Frechette, which I think I demonstrated by walking through those plots. Um, and uh, longer periods of hot, dry summers. We're already seeing that. Unpredictable and or sustained spring heating. You notice the examples from June, uh, typically in June, but there are also earlier ones in uh, February and March. Occasional high intensity rainfall. I didn't get a chance to talk about this at all, but that's happening, um, particularly in association with atmospheric rivers, which do reach us out here, as we know. And there's um, a lot of study going on around the, the, those impacts on interior BC. And as I mentioned at the end, the growing in occurrence of geomorphic impacts, and, and some of which are associated with hydrologic feedbacks. That's quite the list. Uh, it's probably going to be patchy. And over time, the, um, the trend will be that there will be more and more of these things converging. Um, later on in the century, well, that's a bit more of a question mark because um, the first few decades that I'm talking about in this slide, um, the change is largely baked in with 
um, the emissions that we've had in the past, the greenhouse gas emissions. There's a little bit of leeway, but mostly it's going to happen now. But it's the next period where we actually have a chance to reduce that. So many questions remain. Which effects will dominate in the next few years and decades? And how will these hydrologic changes interact and accumulate? This is a very active area of research. Mostly, though, expect the unexpected. It's, uh, it's really hard to plan uh, uh, year to year until we know the kind of signature of the weather and say maybe the three month forecasts that are starting that start to come out. OK, let's just what have I got about 10 minutes. So that's plenty for going through some responses to this escalating uncertainty. I've got three proposals for you. The first is, of course, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and let us each do all that we can. That is the fundamental uh, strongest response to the uh, changes that are happening. Remove the driving force. Second, though, develop landscape resilience. We have a history uh, of managing uh, the landscape and water, um, water resources to a maximum risk tolerance. We define the risk tolerance and then we often manage to it. I think we need to move away from that. And in, in its place, we should be emphasizing precaution. That is not moving forward if we don't know something. Um, restoration and uh, risk reduction. So where we can actually reduce the risk. The goal overall is to develop res resilience so that the land and water is more able to withstand these changes that are occurring. And lastly, measure what is happening. Current monitoring is insufficient or it's not located where it's needed. It's, um, there are some strong monitoring networks in place, but they've not been built up, uh, integrated in a scientific way often. Um, and a companion to the monitoring would be to enable retention, access, and integration of water data. It tends to be um, in different locations, not always readily available as well. So I'd like to just explore this uh, um, measure what is happening um, part with some examples of what actually is happening. So first of all, I wanna go back um, in time to this area just between uh, sort of the center of the West Kootenai between Kootenai Lake and Arrow Reservoir with Slocan Lake in the middle. Um, and just look at the history of hydrometric monitoring. 1910s, you can see all the red dots. Just going to quietly let you look. 30s, 40s, 50s. Now we're starting to see the decline after the 50s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s. And here we go. This is what we have left the red dots. The yellow ones are all discontinued. And this is fairly typical. This is uh, just an example area. Um, and this sort of tells the story. We see here that the uh, drainages that have been removed are typically the small and medium sized ones. The ones that have been retained are the large ones. And that's what more or less characterizes our hydrometric network. Um, not totally, but um, dominantly. And we see the pattern in other areas of monitoring, not to belabor the point, but hydrometric, water quality, climate, snow. There was a peak and then it's tended to come down. But it's not just the amount, it's also how it's structured and put together. Um, this comes out of a report that um, I wrote for the Columbia Basin Trust in 2017, looking at water monitoring in relation to climate change impacts. And uh, notable gaps in the upper Columbia Basin include, as, we, as I just said, the hydrometric monitoring for small and medium-sized watersheds, high elevation climate stations. We know not enough about what's going on in climate at high elevation changes to snowfall and snowpack, especially at mid and high elevation and, and glacier mass balance and rate of decline. And there's some additional gaps. I can just invite you to read that if you, if you can. And um, so what are we gonna do about this? Well, there is an, some action happening in this area. It's led by Living Lakes Canada, and it's actually work underway to develop what is being called a priority monitoring matrix to guide station selection and parameter selection so as to strengthen the basis for responding to the growing climate disruption. There was a workshop held in June 2020. You can see the 
proceedings on the right and to create a scientific framework and a, and a methodology for expanding water monitoring in the basin. And briefly about the methodology, because I was involved with it as um, uh, was Greg Utzig and a number of people who came to the workshop. The methodology uses water balance concept as the underlying scientific model for organizing expanded monitoring. And watershed units of interest are stratified into groups with similar flow regimes and responses to changing climate and or disturbance. And based on those, their hydrologic characteristics, watersheds with similar behavior are expected to respond similarly. And so monitoring results from one watershed in a group can be extrapolated to others within that group. That's the principle. And it's actually underway on a pilot basis in three uh, regions of the Columbia Basin. So this is promising uh, to build a greater, stronger basis for at least understanding what's going on. And um, briefly, there's also a Columbia Basin Water Hub, also led by Living Lakes Canada, which is creating kind of a cousin to the um, uh, earlier initiative. And this is a central repository to store and access current and historical water data. The idea is that it will support data-driven decision-making and community planning. Data sources come from a wide range of sources. And it also has features for easy access to data, including providing links to other existing water data portals relevant to the Columbia Basin and customized support. It's quite innovative. There's uh, 200 data sets, 39 contributors and growing, and it was just launched. I, I'm spending a bit of time talking about these two so that we can end on a positive note, because uh, I know the subject matter can be a bit heavy, but there are things we can do from reducing our greenhouse gases to changing our management practices to studying and finding out more, uh, measuring more of what's going on. So that's positive. And in conclusion then, um, <laughs> I throw five conclusions out. First, I say the unpredictability defines surface hydrology in the coming decades. It really does define it. And what's interesting is the extremes are growing simultaneously at both ends of the spectrum. We're basically burning the candle at both ends. Um, there appears to be a sharp, perhaps non-linear jump in non-stationarity since maybe 2000. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Brian Manunas might have said something about some non-linearity in the glacier decline since about 2010. So it looks like something's happening that's a little bit unusual in the last decade or two. And given the unleashed uncertainty that um, is now um, uh, running here, I think a more cautious risk of a risk averse approach to land and water management becomes appropriate. And lastly, expanded monitoring can assist us in managing the basins, ecological and human communities through the long bumpy transition, which will probably outlive everyone um, watching this, um, participating in this webinar today. Again, I'd like to thank the following for their contribu contributions to the presentation. Hans Schreier and I worked together on those quantitative plots, and I do appreciate the collaboration. Uh, Greg Utzig for his slides and his um, ideas. Mel Reisner supported with some of the slides. Living Lakes Canada provided information about those two initiatives, and Sam Lister worked on the uh, history of hydrometric monitoring. So thank you all. And um, that concludes the presentation. Thanks work, Martin. That was a lot of material to cover. Um, it was great, really thought provoking. Uh, you do have some questions that are that are coming in already. Um, and I imagine there will be more. Um, so I'll just direct people to the Q&A box again. Um, again, you can find that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you'll open the Q&A. Um, if you see a question that's already up there that you'd like to see the answer to, click the thumbs up. That'll give it an upvote. And there have been some hands we noticed going up and down um, over the time that you were speaking. All of them are down at the moment. If anybody would like to be unmuted to ask their question, you can you can raise your hand and we'll we'll call on you in a moment. So, Martin, I'm going to relay some questions to you, and then you can do your best to to answer. Thanks. Um, I'll start with Richard Johnson's question. He says, do fish adjust their spawning times in response to runoff and or temperature and or daylight or what? Well, not being a fish biologist, I don't have um, a, a full response to this, 
But my understanding is there is some ability to adjust, but it can only go so far. I mean, but I'm, I'm out of my depth on talking about the biological responses of fish to the changes. I think it's safe to say that the changes are abrupt and they're, they're pretty significant. These are weeks we're talking about. And, and in any given year, it could be much more than the average. So I think that's all I can offer. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for that. Um, so I'm gonna move on to, I'm actually gonna, even though it doesn't have a ton of upvotes, but um, we'll give early bird gets the worm type deal here. I'd like to just um, address Colin Mahoney's question. So Colin is actually one of our speakers uh, in a couple of weeks. And he says, what is the data source for the projected precipitation as snow declines in 2100? I'd have to check the slide. I think it was PCIC, the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium. But um, <clears throat> I definitely can get that for you, Colin. Great, thanks. Okay, so on to Mike Miller. Um, do you expect the ocean to provide a moderating effect on temperature extremes in the BC coast as compared to the interior? Could precipitation, sorry, could the precipitation that coastal regions are less at risk lead to complacency by decision makers who tend to be based in coastal areas? Hi, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, we do obviously live with a coastal, a coastal bias in the province because that's where uh, most decision makers live. And I, I think as we move increasingly to a pluvial regime here, we, and, and the energy in the system uh, grows and there's more uh, moisture because the moisture in the <clears throat> atmosphere goes up with uh, the temperature. I think there is a chance that we will become more and more coastal like and <clears throat> and I I would I would say it's possible that over time we could be uh, in experiencing more of what the coast is experiencing and it not getting recognized until it's really happening so that was kind of a wordy response but uh, I don't know about the moderating effect on temperature extremes though Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, thanks. Um, there's a question from Greg Gregoire, but Gregoire, I just want to let you know that you might need to clarify your question. So I'll read it out, and then and then you might need to add some more detail. He says, "Are those recent data graphs and info published or to be published in a report?" I'm not sure which data he's referring to. Well, everything in the presentation is from the current science that's come out in 2022 to work that was done back to maybe 2010 or even 2007. So it's an assemblage of a lot of work. So no, it's not going to be published in a report. It's just in this presentation. And it's a very dynamic area of science. Like it just keeps moving along. Some parts stay valid, other parts fall off the edge as and gets replaced by more current stuff. So. Um, this presentation will be live on online, I understand, though, so you could see it again there or get in touch with me and I can share specifics. Yeah, absolutely. And if anybody needs assistance getting in, in touch with Martin, you can you already have my contact. I can redirect you. Um, OK, great. So Charlie asks, how might the surface water? Oh, sorry, the questions are bouncing around. How might the surface water changes you presented interact with groundwater hydrology? Similar changes? delayed changes? Really good question, Charlie. I, I, um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to talk about groundwater during the talk. Um, it often gets neglected, and here I did it again. <laughs> but it's uh, definitely going to be affected. There is some good work come out of um, um, it's SFU, I believe, looking at the effects of the changing snow, um, snow drought on um, on uh, low flows. And in general, I would say that the loss of snow isn't good for groundwater because it provides a nice slow recharge mechanism and the faster runoff will tend to not recharge uh, groundwater as well. So as a general comment, I'd say it's not a great effect on groundwater. And of course, humans are probably going to start uh, pumping groundwater more. Um, because of uh, disruption of surface water sources. So there'll be that secondary effect there too. 
Great, thank you. Um, a popular question from Laura Sachs. She says, can you explain more about the types of land use policies that we should be pushing for to build hydrologic resiliency in this time of unpredictability? Oh, they're extensive. There's just so many things one could mention. Um, certainly um, a, a lighter touch on forest harvest and road building would go a long way to um, provide more resilience for forest cover. Um, but in general, uh, extraction of water, um, the um, any, anywhere where we push a system to um, a limit under assumptions of certain resilience and opportunity, I think we just need to be lowering those limits. Um, tenures that are uh, put out in the back country, uh, any further kind of um, consumption of wild areas will be, will be um, I would say should be discouraged on this basis. And um, so that we have areas that uh, can still respond resiliently to these changes. Now, it, you've got to get into the details though, because some areas are just more resilient than others. And I think we need to start identifying those. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay, great. Thanks, Martin. Um, just before I move on to the next question, I'll just um, draw attention to the chat. I see that there are a number of resources that are being placed in there. Um, so thanks, Paige, for doing that. Feel free to check out the chat for those resources. Um, I can copy and paste those. I actually, I can have access to those. So if anybody misses those and they'd like to get those resources, you can email, the, email me for that later. Okay, so there's a question here from, um, I believe it's Michelle. I believe her name uh, has been cut off inappropriately in the, in the way that her data was entered into the Zoom platform here. So I think the question is from Michelle and she says, do we know what the appropriate percentage of glacier contribution is to the July and August discharge of the Illicillowat River running dry, uh, river during dry years? Uh, well, I don't, wouldn't say there's a, Oh, approximate percentage, not appropriate, approximate percentage. I don't know that. Um, that, that might be something that is known though. Um, yeah, I wouldn't know, we'd have to go and, and actually find that. So, sorry, Michelle. Great, okay, great. Um, any other questions before we, before we close off for the day? Okay, I'm hearing none. Uh, Martin, thank you very much for your time. Um, I know it was a lot to display. I think you did a great job of wrapping it up for us at the end. Um, thanks for the resources and, and for your continued work on this highly variable complex topic. Um, I just have a couple of things that I would like to note before we close off. So of course, another round of thank yous is due. The Columbia Basin Trust for your financial support, thank you. Everyone here today who donated for the series, thank you very much for your support. Um, truly, it wouldn't be possible without your support, so thank you. Um, a recording of this talk and past talks and future talks will all end up on the event webpage, as I, as I noted. You can find that at cmiae.org. Um, please share the resources with your network. These talks are available for further viewing, and um, it would be great to make sure that they are widely distributed. Uh, next week, we're going to be welcoming Dr. Suzanne Simard from the University of British Columbia, somebody you may have heard of. Um, you've likely heard of a popular book, Finding the Mother Tree. And then in this talk, we'll hear from uh, some of her promise, oh, sorry, and in this talk, we'll be hearing about some promising mitigation measures as they pertain to forestry in our area. Suzanne will present her talk entitled The Mother Tree Project, Finding New Ways to Practice Forestry in Our Changing Climate. And it'll take place at the, the same time, same, same hour next week. So we'll, we'll be presenting that on Thursday, February 10th at 12 p.m. Pacific. Um, I think that's it. I hope to see all of you next week. And thank you very much for joining us.